Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network. Welcome to Talking Head Pain, the podcast that confronts head pain head on. Hi, I'm Joe Ko, Director of Education and Digital Strategy at the Global Healthy Living Foundation. And as you know, I've been living with migraine for over 20 years, and I've learned that no matter how long you've been on your personal journey, we all can agree that living with migraine can lead to profound changes in our lives. These are changes that today's guest, J.P. Summers, has experienced firsthand. J.P. is an author, journalist, and fellow at the Global Healthy Living Foundation. Hi, J.P. How are you today? I'm doing great, Joe. And you? I can't complain. It's a good day when I get to do talking head pain and talk to wonderful people like you. So we'll jump right in, JP. Can you explain to the audience what your worst migraine experience was like? Sure. So um, my worst migraine experience was when I was in the eighth grade. I was actually in the middle of taking a test and all of a sudden on my left eye, I was having um, what they would consider floaters. And so all of a sudden my left eye had all these little floaters. Um, it kind of looked like little butterflies, like sparkly butterflies. And then within a matter of seconds, I couldn't see on my left eye. So my reaction was to just head out to the nurse's clinic. Cause that's what I was, you know, that's my norm. And as I was walking down the hallway, which typically wasn't that far, but um, I started losing vision in my other eye. So I was walking and holding onto the wall, which basically were all lockers. And I was trying to feel my way to the nurse's clinic whose door was always open. And as I was walking, it's like tunnel vision. And like, even the sounds, I could barely hear anything. Like my hearing almost went, like I was almost deaf. And by the time I made it, which seemed like an eternity into the nurse's clinic, um, she looked right at me and I could barely see her. And all I said was migraine. And from that time, um, and again, um, I don't recall anything what people have told me, my parents, the nurse, uh, the physician. So apparently my parents picked me up from school, drove me to the physician's office, they then administered what would be a migraine cocktail, which is a mixture of different kinds of meds that they they tend to use a combination of usually three to kind of help um, alleviate the, the migraine symptoms. And um, that was done. Apparently, I was there for two hours from what I was told. Then I was driven back home. I did not wake up. So around the time frame, I was told it was like about maybe uh, like one o'clock in the afternoon at school. So by the time I woke up, it was 10 o'clock at night. When I woke up, I had no idea where I was at. I didn't even know what day we were on. I mean, I absolutely like, I don't remember anything. And again, I was just told the story of what happened. And for someone who never experienced a migraine attack that severe, that um, debilitating, it, I was shocked that I'm like thinking, how could I have lost those many hours of time. And it's scary because that did happen several times. I would say at least 10 times from um, that, that in the eighth grade, it happened to me several times over the years. And yeah, again, that was probably the most terrifying um, migrant attack I ever experienced. Yeah, that sounds really intense, particularly the loss of time. Mm -hmm. That leads me to my next question, JP. What are some of the things that you've lost by living with migraine? Oh, gosh. Um, the, the top two that always stick out the most when I'm advocating, when I'm sharing my story is um, the first one would be loss of driving. I actually, my neurologist, um, when I started to have debilitating symptoms with my motor skills. I had a uh, weakness in my hands, uh, movement. I had difficulties walking. Uh, I actually had to have help to get around. And that led my neurologist to suspend my driving privileges for two whole years. That is how debilitating, that's how severe um, that all of actually my symptoms were. So for two whole years, I had to have people drive me to doctor's appointments, drive me to the store. I mean, just the simple things that 
you take for granted people had to to pitch in my daughter who just got her license was driving me just down the road just to uh, run an errand and to lose that part you know something that you that you just normally don't think that would happen um that was very difficult for me to accept and um because of my not not being able to drive that then led to a loss of a career at the time I was seeking medical uh, advice I was trying to get treatment trying to figure out what was going on why why was my neurological state so bad and of course uh, I would had a banking career at 13 years at that point after you know they use the FMLA I was let go. So I lost a 13 year career, which is something I never, ever imagined migraine would take away from me because most people lose loss of uh, lose days, you know, they'll maybe miss uh, maybe some hours, a uh, few days, but never did I ever imagine uh, losing um, the ability to drive and um, a career would be the result of having the migraine disease. How did that realization that you couldn't work anymore or losing your career uh, impact you emotionally, oh. physically? Oh my gosh. So I know that it wasn't that I was, I wasn't fired. I know that, but mentally and emotionally, I felt that I fit like a failure. I felt that I failed myself as a person, everything I worked hard for all the years that I, that I put 13 years, I put in for training. I took uh, classes, you know, I built those customer relationships, you know, just all of everything that I worked hard for and was gone. And that emotionally drained me. It put me into, I mean, I wasn't diagnosed with depression, but personally, I felt that I did go through depression because I, I was in pain for one. Um, I had all these symptoms going on. Um, if it wasn't, um, you know, visual disturbances or sensitivity light, or, uh, again, the decreased motor skills, of, um, not being able to walk unassisted, just the, the things that symptoms that you get, um, you know, with having the migraine disease, but I mean, mentally, I felt like a failure. I felt like I can't believe that, that I allowed this to happen. How, how could I have, um, come to this point. So it does affect you. And I think for me personally, um, just knowing that, Hey, you know what? I'm, I know that this happened, but I have to get better. I have to, you know, find a way to get back, um, at least part of what I lost. So yeah, it definitely does take a toll on you a lot more than what people realize. So JP, how did you find purpose and reclaim that sense of self? It took a good year for me to kind of put a positive spin on what was going on with me. And uh, I found online community where I was able to join um, online support groups for people living with migraine and other headache disorders. And through that, someone reached out to me and said, hey, we have this, you know, we have ways that you can share your story. And when I was told that my story could help others, it, I, I just couldn't not think about the positive things that could come from it. And that gave me so much purpose. That gave me a reason to want to keep going, to keep pushing for a better quality of life. I know you personally from working with you at the Global Healthy Living Foundation and through your advocacy. And I know that you're a mom and you have a child or multiple children with migraine. I'm actually not sure. But when you learned that your 10-year-old was diagnosed with migraine, what went through your head? So the moment we found out that he did in fact have migraine, the first thought that went through my mind is, I cannot believe one of my, one of my children has to go through this. And the next thing was, okay, we have to be aggressive. We have to find a treatment because I do not want my 10 year old who is actually um, going through the same symptoms, very similar to what I was going through at that time. We both were hit with chronic migraine at the same time. And um, it was just, I just felt like I had to do everything and anything possible so that he can still have 
um, his youth, you know, he, he was only 10. I was, yeah. I mean, I've had migraine for three decades, you know, 35 years, but here's my child who hasn't even experienced middle school, high school, none of the things that I got to experience. And I, and I just already saw him in just this, uh, debilitating state that he, he needed some kind of treatment plan regimen in place so that we could give him the best chance of having a scholastic career. And yeah, so it was just one of those moments where you, you feel like you've got to do anything and everything as a parent, uh, but also as someone who has migraine to help them live a better quality of life. That's so important. Your child is lucky to have such a fierce advocate for him in his treatment, because I know that you're fierce and you know how to advocate. So it's unfortunate that you have to use those skills for your own family. Mm -hmm. um, but it's something I can relate to um, helping people that I know live with migraine, uh, get better treatment. Uh, I want to talk more about your upbringing and being part of the Latina or Latino community. How has that shaped your migraine headache experience? And what would you want people to know about that? Growing up um, in a Hispanic culture, it's, you know, it's, it's one of those things that there are a lot of, of relatives, believe it or not, that have migraine in my family. And the, the odd thing is that no one really talked about it. And, you know, I have aunts and uh, great aunts, uh, believe it or not, there's, there's no males. My son is the only one that we know of at this point that has migraine, but I have so many cousins and again, no one talked about it. I was the only one that was constantly, even as a kid, you know, when I, I was diagnosed at 10, I was constantly talking about it. So I should have known I was going to be in, involved in advocacy at some point because I wouldn't not talk about it. It was the realization that when I did start advocating, a lot of them were not educated. They didn't know where to look for resources. Um, half of my family speak Spanish only. Where would they go to find those resources? Because again, they need help translating. So I, again, see that, you know, difference in bringing forth the resources they need, but also it's not just them. It's, I also have friends, you know, uh, that again, uh, Latino, Latina, uh, and they too have the same situation where half of their family only speaks Spanish. Even the ones that are bilingual still struggle to explain certain terminology. So there is that need to bring more education, more resources to the Hispanic community. Anything that I'm able to do to help um, that is part of not just uh, something I do as an advocate, but also as someone who lives with migraine that I want my family, I want my friends to be able to share, to be able to give information that can help others in our community. And again, it's very important to reach out to people with those different um, backgrounds, again, whether they're um, only Spanish speaking or they're bilingual, again, to just kind of bring the information that they need to help them get the most effective treatment for them. So important. I remember we did a video campaign at GHLF called 86 Migraine, and um, my colleague, Dr. Daniel Hernandez, translated them into Spanish. We felt it was really important to at least start doing that mm -hmm. because it's it's so missing in the migraine advocacy community and education reaching spanish speaking folks um definitely a lot more to be done and a lot more that we can do so it's important to listen to that experience that you're sharing i want to close this out by thinking about what brings you joy and happiness and i know that one of those things is reporting and going to comic con and events like that. Yes. So what about Comic-Con brings you joy? Uh, how do you get energized by that? And how do you manage like these really loud, colorful, vibrant events while living with migraine? Yes. So um, back in 2018, um, because of my experience as a freelance writer and blogger, I got to do media coverage at my very first Comic-Con, which a lot of people don't know this, or maybe they do. 
I call myself a big geek mom. I love um, anything and everything comic book related, Marvel, DC, Star Wars. Yeah, you name it. I just love it. And so to be able to go to these events was just like amazing to see these celebrities, see people dressed up in cosplay. I mean, I felt like this is amazing. Why would, why did I never do this before? So one of my biggest obstacles was, you know, knowing that I live with migraine disease, how can I attend these events? Like you mentioned that have these bright lights, uh, just different things going on. So um, I always prepare ahead of time. I scout out the venue because each event takes place at either a convention center or a stadium. So I'm always constantly looking to see what their policies are, because one thing that um, someone that's chronically ill, we have to have meds on us at all time medications. So I always like to see what is their policy about bringing in um, liquids or checking out where their food stands or water stations, because then they allow you to bring in a water bottle because you always have to have liquids on you or, you know, something to drink when you take your medication, but also finding out where their first aid stations are, because when you have a migraine attack, Sometimes you need extra help. And when I say extra help, you may need to have someone, again, if you lose your sight, um, even if it's partial, you may need to have someone help you. And when you're at this big event, you know, you, you need to know basically your, your exit strategy. But when you're also going into doing so, my favorite part is the celebrity panels. And let me tell you, I never want to miss one of those because that's where you hear all the good stuff. <laughs> you hear things you do, wouldn't typically hear a celebrity talk about in a regular interview. So I'm like, I'm not going to miss those. And so again, I'm just figuring out, okay, so when you go in there, try to sit in the area where you know you need, if you need to make a quick exit, you're able to leave, but also um, carrying around my bag of necessities. I carry earplugs. I have my sunglasses. You know, I have um, just all kinds of things I typically would use during a migraine attack. And a lot of times um, I will sit on the floor. I mean, I have, I've, you know, I carry a sweatshirt or like a jacket or something, but I'll set it down on the floor because I need to sit that moment. I need to sit down if there's not any benches or anything and take my meds. And, and even I just need to rest. I need to rest to see what the next steps would be if I'm able to go back in or do I have to get an Uber to head out? Because again, even though I drove myself there, something that'll, again, I still have the difficulties of driving um, when I have a migraine attack. So again, making sure that all areas of, of self-care, but also my own care are taken care of. Because like I said, you don't, when you go to these events, you want to be there all day. You want to take in everything. You want to be able to experience it. And it's, it's one of those things where I, yes, it brings me joy because I just love to see all these families dressed in cosplay, but also again, meeting celebrities, getting to talk to celebrities. I mean, that right there in itself, I mean, it's so rewarding. So the fact that I'm able to do that, uh, despite living with migraine disease, for me, that brings me joy. It really does. So <laughs> it's amazing. Before I do a follow up question about Comic Con and Marvel versus <laughs> DC, I want to plug that we have a podcast uh, at the GHLF Podcast Network called Dungeons and Diagnoses. If people are interested, you could find it at ghlf.org slash listen. And it's chronic disease characters playing Dungeons and Dragons. So a really cool concept for those um, people that are into gaming and Comic-Con and cosplay and all that fun stuff. So I need to know, JP, Marvel <laughs> or DC, favorite characters, <laughs> where, where do you land here? So I have to say, and, and this is a tough, this is a tough question, Joe. It really is because um, I was more DC up until... Um, I got to meet um, <laughs> Mark Ruffalo in person and actually interview him. So um, my loyalty is now to Marvel. And I love, I love the Avengers. So of course, you know, that's just, I'm a Marvel girl. So I definitely, I, if you look at my t-shirt collection, it's more Marvel, <laughs> Captain Marvel, Avengers. <laughs> so things like that. <laughs> Ed, Edward or Jacob? 
Oh my gosh, Team Jacob all the way. I, I, oh, that's <laughs> an interesting twist. I actually, yeah. And you know what? I, to this day, I actually have um, Team Jacob stuff. I'm not even embarrassed to admit it, but Team Jacob all the way. Team Jacob. I will never not be Team Jacob. <laughs> Well, very good, JP. This was so much fun. Um, I feel like I'm talking to a celebrity. <laughs> so this is my own um, Comic-Con, but not a comic or a con. What does <laughs> con mean? A convention. I'm like, is it a fake comic? <laughs> Delight always speaking with you. Your passion and energy for sharing your story is um, really motivating and helpful. And I know that your voice and energy uh, reaches so many people and appreciate you taking time today to speak with me for Talking Head Pain. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Talking with JP is always so energizing. The way she has overcome her struggles living with migraine is really inspiring and is a great example of doing what you can do while you live with migraine. What is something that you love to do but requires some migraine preparedness? For me, it's working out at the gym, and I'm sure if you live with migraine, you have your way of managing to help you live your best life. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Talking Head Pain, the podcast that confronts head pain head on. If you like this episode, please give it an honest five-star rating and subscribe so you never miss another one. I'm Joe Co, and I will see you next time. Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network.